Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Okay. So for over 30 years, combat combating gender-based violence has been the cornerstone of President Biden's career. When Joe Biden was growing up, his father used to say to him that the cardinal sin was abuse of power. And that includes a man raising his hand to a woman or a child. When he was a young man and serving as a U.S. Senator, he saw how society looked away from violence against women. Few police departments had special victims unit. Many states had laws on the books that protected the abusers rather than the victims. More often than not, marital rape wasn't considered a crime. There was no national hotline to call. Women's shelters were referred to as indoctrination centers. All of this was completely unacceptable to Joe Biden. It's why in 1990, then Senator Biden wrote the landmark legislation, the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, to protect women from domestic violence, stalking, and sexual assault. But we knew that wasn't enough. So as chairman, or he knew that wasn't enough. So as chairman of the, of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he held public hearings on violence against women where courageous survivors shared stories of horrific, horrific violence. And his committee published groundbreaking reports on the impact of violence against women, documenting this tragedy in a way that policymakers could not ignore. It took years of building awareness, legislative expertise, and perseverance, perseverance by Senator Biden, by then Senator Biden in 1994. Vawa passed Congress. For decades, he has worked across the aisle to strengthen it. As president, he continued to expand his signature legislation, using every legislative and administrative avenue to address gender-based violence during his presidency. And today, to keep building on his proudest legislative achievement, Joe Biden is announcing new actions to combat gender-based violence. A total of more than $690 million in new funds to support survivors of gender-based violence, guidance on new protections to meet the housing needs of survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, dating violence, and stalking, a new national resource center on cyber crimes, against individuals to help law enforcement and community-based organizations prevent, enforce, enforce, and prosecute cyber crimes. New private sector commitments to take on the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and cyber crimes against individuals. And new actions to support law enforcement in removing guns from domestic abusers. The president is proud that between 1993 and 2022, annual domestic violence rates dropped by 67%, and the rate of rapes and sexual assault declined by 56%. It is one of the reasons why Joe Biden calls it his proudest legislative achievement. But he knows there is more work to do, so it is why today his new actions are so, so important. As the president said, and I quote, today, as we mark three decades since we passed into law the Violence Against Women Act, we celebrate our progress while recommitting to the work ahead. Also, the president and his senior team are closely monitoring the impacts of Francine as it moves through the to the southern U United States. FEMA Administrator Criswell is currently in Louisiana she will meet with state and local officials, survey damages, and provide an update on our response efforts. Before Francine made landfall, the president approved La Governor Landry's of Louisiana's request for an emergency declaration, which unlocked federal assistance to help support life-saving and life-sustaining efforts. Over 700 federal personnel, including 128 urban search and rescue personnel, are in Louisiana and ready to support any emergency response requests from the state. FEMA has also <coughs> pre-positioned more than 750,000 meals, 1.2 million liters of water to support the needs of survivors. We continue to encourage those who are in the path of Francine to stay alert 
visit ready.gov for tips on how to stay safe and follow the recommendations of state and local officials. The Biden-Harris administration stands ready to provide additional support to impacted areas as necessary. And as I'm sure you guys already have heard this, but over the course of, of this administration and during his time as vice president, President Biden's approach to foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere has been based on his belief that democracy is fundamentally vital for sustained economic prosperity and security. Now, Venezuela is no exception and the blatant electoral fraud following the July 28 presidential elections must continue to be condemned and those obstructing democracy held accountable. And that is why to that end, today we took two important actions to hold Nicolas Maduro and his cronies accountable for their blatant electoral fraud obstruction of a competitive and inclusive election and violation of the civil of the civil and human rights of the people. First, the Department of Treasury sanctioned 16 Maduro affiliated officials. Second, the Department of State imposed new visa restrictions on a significant number of Maduro aligned officials who have undermined the electoral process in Venezuela and are responsible for acts of repression. To date, the U.S. government has sanctioned over 140 current or former Venezuelan officials and taken steps to impose visa restrictions on nearly 2,000 individuals. The United, the United States does not stand alone here in expressing our concerns with Maduro's anti-democratic actions. This morning at the UN headquarters in New York, we stood besides Panama and more than 50 other countries from across the region and globe to express our continued commitment to Venezuelan-led democratic norms, as well as our deep concern with the politically motivated arrest warrant issued by Venezuelan authorities, Edmund Gonzalez Urrutia. The United States will continue to work with our international partners to encourage Venezuelan-led constructive and inclusive dialogue to restore democratic norms, ensure Maduro and his representatives are held accountable for their actions, and support the people's aspirations for a democracy and a more prosperous future. In the meantime, we cannot stand by while Maduro and his representatives blatantly commit electoral fraud and use violence indiscriminate repression to silence opposition to Maduro's rule, hence our actions today. At the beginning of this administration, President Biden made the decision to take the Quad to the leader level, and next weekend, President Biden will host the fourth in-person Quad Leader Summit in Wilmington, Delaware. The President looks forward to welcoming Prime Minister of Australia, Prime Minister of India, and the Prime Minister of Japan. This will be President Biden's first time hosting foreign leaders in Wilmington as president, a reflection of his deep personal relationships with each of the Quad leaders and the importance of the Quad to all of our countries. The Biden-Harris administration has made elevating and institutionalizing the Quad a top priority, and this leaders commit summit will focus on bolstering the strategic convergence among our countries, advancing our shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region, and delivering concrete benefits for our partners in the Indo-Pacific in key areas. We will have more, uh, more of the Wilmington-specific uh, base details uh, in days ahead of this particular uh, Quad Summit that's happening next weekend. And lastly, this is uh, a fun thing for all of us here. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to congratulate. We're going about to embarrass her wholeheartedly, and I'm really happy about that because she should be. And she's such a great person. Uh, and celebrate Kelly Scully. Well, Kelly's been supporting our team and working with many of you on healthcare and education stories, uh, and she's not leaving. <laughs> but she's also been working on her own story on love. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to deliver that one. <laughs> anyway, Kelly and her fiance Joe, who is here in the back of the room. Kelly does, does not know this. Hi, Joe. And she thought she was here for a while. Uh, they will tie the knot just outside of Florence, Italy next week. None of us were invited. <laughs> Maybe she invited you guys. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm so proud uh, that Kelly was able to, um, to find love. Uh, and she is the fourth 
the fourth spokesperson in the Biden Harris press office to get married during his term. Uh, so maybe I should take some credit for that. I don't know, uh, but maybe, probably not. Um, but anyway, Kelly, you are indispensable <laughs> member of our team. There's a lot of like internal jokes subtext, happening. Yeah. yeah, subtext here happening. And so we could not be happier for you and Joe. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi. Uh, please join us in wishing them, in all seriousness, a lifetime of love and happiness. And we can't wait to have you back, Kelly. And uh, congratulations to you, Joy. Joe. I was about to call you something else. Joe. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you for, for being here. I know you were, had a busy day, so thank you for stopping by, Joe. Okay. Are you fully embarrassed? No. No. Oh, you want more? You want more embarrassment? Another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to it. I know it's late. Um, Colleen. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so a couple things. Um, can you tell us how the president thought the debate went? Um, where did he watch it? How did he consume the details of the debate? Yeah, so as you know, he was in New York uh, ahead of uh, September 11th, so he watched it at, at the hotel uh, in New York. And I'm going to be careful. I'm, I'm going to give you an answer, but I'm going to be careful because it is a 2024 campaign. So I uh, just have to say that at the top. But um, what the president saw directly for himself is a he saw a commanding, optimistic performance uh, from the leader who he's been working uh, with uh, for the past three and a half years, side by side. And uh, he heard a powerful case for shared values uh, that they have and shared policy goals that they have, uh, standing up for our rights against dangerous abortion and IVF bans, tax cuts and lower costs for families to keep us on the strong economic growth trajectory uh, instead of magonomics. You hear me talk about this, the $4,000 increase in taxes and cuts for working people. Uh, he, saw, he also saw her, again, demonstrate her commitment to keeping us more secure and safe uh, not just here, but obviously around the world. And he saw someone who, someone who continues, continues uh, to put uh, the American people uh, first. And she did, she did it in an optimistic way, uh, in an optimist, optimistic and, and dominant and powerful way. And I think you saw, uh, you, you saw his, uh, his tweet, bless you, um, that uh, he put out, that his team put out that night. And so he's very, very proud of her. Um, on. September 11th, uh, did the, pres the president and, the, and Donald Trump were together and you know, standing near each other, did they have any conversations? Did they speak about anything? Uh, I don't have any conversations to read out. I think you saw everything was pretty much uh, being recorded in real time uh, outside of what you, you saw yourselves by looking at the video. I don't have anything else to, to add. Yeah. One other thing, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah. On the Wilmington summit, <laughs> uh, I just wondered if you could share anything about, you know, is is the president going to have the leaders to his house for a barbecue, <laughs> or you know, uh, what are the plans for how he's going to entertain the leaders? Yeah, we did say it was personal, right? Uh, yeah. Politics is personal, um, and uh, he believes politics, and and obviously in this case, foreign policy is personal. Uh, I don't have anything else uh, to to share beyond uh, what I gave at the top. Uh, of the briefing here, but he's looking forward to doing this. It is the first time hosting foreign leaders in Wilmington, uh, as I just said at the top. And I think it's going to be an opportunity for him to reflect uh, certainly of his deep personal relationships that he's had with each of the quad leaders, uh, and we'll have, certainly we'll have more soon to share. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Thank you Karine. Um, there is a woman named Laura Loomer who recently tweeted that if the vice president wins the election, the White House will smell like curry, and White House speeches will be facilitated via a call center, uh, among other things. She recently traveled with the former president, and I wonder if President Biden has read these remarks and his response. Let me tell you our, our response from here. It is uh, repugnant, these types of comments. It is un-American. Uh, to say these types of things, exactly uh, the kind of hateful uh, and divisive rhetoric, rhetoric that we should denounce and we should not, uh, should not be part of the fabric uh, of this country. It doesn't matter what your pol political views are. Uh, you should stand and condemn and condemn these types of uh, just repugnant, repugnant words. Uh, no leader should ever associate with someone who spreads this kind of 
ugliness, uh, this kind of racist poison. That's what this is. And who continues to fan these types of dangerous and insulting conspiracy theories like the false notion, like the false notion that the tragic 9-11 attacks were an inside job. We were all with, you all saw, uh, leaders and family members tell their stories yesterday, especially on, at Ground Zero in New York City. We all, I'm sure, some, many of us have personal stories of that day, 9-11 of 2021, and more than 2,000 lives were lost. 2,000. And to say that, that it's an inside job, and to spread that is insulting insulting and we should not uh, no leader should be connected to that or spreading that and as the president Biden has always said it's our duty it is our duty as Americans to give hate no no safe harbor and to bring the country together around our shared values and to recognize and appreciate the unique strength that our diversity gives us as a nation he says this all the time Di our diversity is our strength, and that's what we should be following. On a related note, during the debate, Trump spread false claims and lies about immigrants eating pets in Springfield, Ohio. The city manager disputed those false claims, and today, City Hall was evacuated after a bomb threat was sent to city agencies and media outlets. Does President Biden believe Trump's words and rhetoric contributed to those threats today? So look, I, I want to be super mindful. Uh, we are aware of the reports of a bombing threat, as you just stated, in uh, Springfield, Ohio, uh, at City Hall. Uh, local police obviously is investigating the situation, and we encourage everyone to, to follow the public safety guidance. I don't want to speculate from here uh, the source of the bomb threat, uh, but I do want to take a step back. I think it's important that all of us take a step back here uh, and, and just lean on the facts here. The Springfield, Ohio Police Department has debunked this very bizarre and very hateful smear that's out there. Uh, it is what is happening here is an attempt to tear apart communities and disrespect, let's not forget also disrespecting law enforcement. And that is the opposite of what our country deserves. Uh, it is undignified and an insult to all of us as Americans, not just one community, but to all of us as Americans. And it is spreading filth that makes the lives of the communities that are being smeared here, it puts their lives in danger. And, uh, and it is just, uh, it is just hate speech. That's what it is. And some of your news, some of the news organizations here have reported uh, that uh, uh, some Haitians, Haitians American, Haitian immigrants are fearing, fearing for their safety right now uh, because of result of conspiracy theory. This is what this is. So instead of leaders trying to bring us together uh, around our shared values, which is something that the president believes and, sh and says all the time, as I just stated. Uh, and, you know, the president and the vice president, that's what they want to see. They want to see us come together in our shared values in a respectful way. And I, I, I will say one more thing, and I, and I think if you guys could hear me out for one second, like m maybe we should not have leaders who fall for fake internet conspiracy theories. We should think about that. Maybe we should not have leaders who do that. Our country deserves better. Go ahead. Thanks. A follow up there. Any message from the White House specifically to the residents of Springfield, Ohio? Uh, because of the the the, uh, the bomb threat, or and all that's been going on on social media, yeah. and the conversation around it, how the city managers had to reply. Yeah. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, the Springfield, Ohio Department Police debunking this. Uh, this again, very bizarre, hateful. <coughs> Uh, hateful smear, uh, and uh, and that is something that we appreciate. Uh, we should continue to come together as a country. Uh, we should not be tearing our communities apart. Uh, I do not. I'm sure that the community is dealing with a lot of incoming on this. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, and uh, certainly not. I can't speak to the, the bomb threats and get behind that. There's an investigation that the local police are are looking into. Uh, 
but we appreciate certainly the Ohio Police Department coming out right away uh, in Springfield and saying, this is false, this is not true, debunking, debunking this hateful, uh, very hateful uh, smear. I wanted to ask you actually about another one from the debate. Um, <coughs> former President Trump refused to say plainly whether he wanted Ukraine to win the war. Uh, has the White House fielded any calls from allies about this, what this could mean if he wins, a change in U.S. policy? Um, has it impacted any of the White House's work with yeah. counterparts in Ukraine? So here's what I'm going to say. Look, I'm, I'm not going to answer specifically to what, uh, what happened at the debate. What I will say is President Biden is president right now. And you have seen what he has done over the last three, more than three and a half years. Uh, and he's always made sure that when it comes to foreign <laughs> policy, we have diplomatic conversations. We try to rebuild those relationships that were pretty much soured um, by the last administration. We saw what the last administration did to our relationships across the globe. And as it relates to Ukraine and the, the, the the war that they're fighting because of Russia's aggression, you've seen the president's commitment, continued commitment to making sure that Ukraine has everything that they need uh, to fight for their democracy, to fight for their free freedom. And that's going to be continued, obviously, the president's uh, uh, commitment and the vice president's commitment as well. They've done this as partners over the past two years, more than two years now. And so that is what matters right now in this moment. The signal that we're sending has been very clear to the Ukrainian, the brave people of Ukraine, to our allies and partners, that we are standing behind them and continue uh, to do just that. Is there any update to give on the negotiations in Doha? There was a new statement from <coughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu that uh, definitely suggests that things are not going well. So what I will say is that we are going to continue uh, to work on this agreement. Uh, this is an agreement that will bring hostages out of Gaza. Uh, that's what we want to see. Uh, and obviously, as you know, some of those hostages include American hostages. And we're going to continue to do that under the terms of the, of, the, of the deal that's now on the table. That's what we're focusing on. As you know, and we say this all the time, we're just not going to negotiate in public. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um The President has both the Wilmington Summit and the um, meeting tomorrow with the British Prime Minister. I'm wondering if we can anticipate a press conference at either or both, since yeah. traditionally both would be kind of forums that we get to hear from both. So um, I don't have uh, anything to share on the on, on the Quad Summit as far as a, a, a press conference component. Uh, I, I believe there is not one scheduled for tomorrow. Um, but I can say that, uh, you know, the president uh, obviously is going to continue to, to take questions from all of you, uh, and I just don't have anything to share beyond uh, beyond tomorrow at this time. And then there was a meeting today at the White House with um, leading AI companies. I'm wondering if you could give a readout of, yeah. of what was discussed, mm -hmm. but also if there were any agreements or plans um, headed forward for what uh, the companies and the administration want to do together. So we are going to have a readout. If it hasn't gone out yet, it will go out shortly uh, of that particular meeting that happened this morning, as you just stated. It included White House officials from, uh, from across uh, the campus, Jeff Zients, Lael Brainard, uh, Jake Sullivan, Bruce Reed, and Secretaries of Commerce and Energy were all there, and we'll have a full uh, full readout, hopefully momentarily, uh, that should hit your inboxes. And so I think what you can what you can take from this particular meeting is uh, the continued commitment from the, the president and the vice president to deepen our U.S. leadership as it relates to AI and by ensuring uh, data centers are built in the United States while ensuring the technology is developed responsibly. And so, um, and so that's the, the that's the uh, that that is part of what was discussed in the meetings today, um, and we're talking about uh, you know AI companies, hyperscalers, utility companies, and all of this was to talk about again the data center development of AI. Uh, the meeting focused on accelerating public-private collaboration in advance of U.S. leadership in in, a, in advancing U.S. leadership in AI and how to meet the workforce permitting and infrastructure needs associated with technology. Uh, the, the industry leaders, uh, so you have this, and again, it'll be a more fulsome uh, readout uh, that'll go out to all of you, was Anthropic, uh, OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, um, and a few others. And this has been the President's commitment, uh, the Biden-Harris commitment, in trying to uh, make sure that we uh, get ahead of this, uh, this 
really important technology uh, and make sure that we continue to show our, our leadership. As you know, this is something that we've been focused on for more than a year uh, since uh, July of 2023. Diana um, what we saw yesterday with the president briefly wearing a MAGA hat, since the pool wasn't in the room for that, can you share a little bit more about how that happened and just what kind of message you think it sent? So a couple of things for, for those, like you said, the pool was not in the room, so I just want to make sure I, I lay this out uh, so folks uh, get the context of, of what happened. So we were, uh, the president was in Shanksville uh, Fire Station, uh, one of the locations, obviously, of, um, of where the plane was taken down on September 11th of 2000, uh, 2001. So the president gave an impromptu remarks um, about bipartisan unity. That's what he was talking about. Uh, and and he talked about it in the moment of September 11th. Was, that's what we experienced after 9-11. And, and said that we needed to go back to that bipartisan unity as a country. And so he made those remarks, impromptu remarks, um, to uh, some of the folks who were there on that day. And he offered a, a presidential hat uh, to a man who was wearing a Trump cap. He was wearing a Trump hat, and he offered it to him as a gesture and in return, the man said uh, that uh, in the same spirit, uh, the president should put on his Trump cap. And so the president did very briefly, uh, and that's what happened. It was, it was truly a back and forth about unity uh, and the president remembering a moment in time uh, after a horrific incident on that day and how the country did come together. It didn't, re it didn't matter what political party you were part of. It didn't matter. You came together as a country because we lost so many souls, thousands of souls, more than 2,000 that day. That's what you saw. Did the president and vice president have an opportunity to talk about the debate yesterday throughout their travels? Uh, I'm not going to. Obviously, they saw each other, spent some time with each other. I'm just gonna, not going to get into their private conversation. As I said, he uh, he's very proud of her. Um, he continues. What you saw, uh, and be mindful, what you saw on Tuesday was what he has said. Uh, the best decision that he made, and has said this many times, was uh, when he was um, in 2020 and selecting his running mate, was selecting her. Uh, and uh, he looks forward to continuing to work side by side in the next several months of this, and uh, several months of this, uh, his tenure. And just finally, is there anything you can preview on UNGA specifically? President Zelensky said he does expect to meet with President Biden. He hopes there. Is that something you can confirm? What should we expect from his time in New York? So at this time, I can't confirm uh, any any details or specifics of uh, the, of UNGA week. Uh, as we get closer, we'll, we'll have more to share. We'll have more to share. Hi. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Boeing workers are voting <coughs> on a new labor contract today. Does the president support Boeing workers going on strike after management's uh, proposed contract did not meet workers' demands for a 40% pay rise? Yeah, so I've said many times here when we get these types of questions uh, is that uh, we support, this president supports uh, collective bargaining and believe it is the best way for American workers and employers to come to an agreement for, uh, that works for all parties and do it in a uh, good faith way. And so that's what we believe, that's what this administration believes. And so we are going to uh, encourage both parties uh, to negotiate in that way in good faith uh, and reaching a strong uh, contract. And so we've said this many times uh, when we get to, when we hear, uh, uh, companies and unions and these types of disputes, uh, and uh, just leave it there. When was the last time a member of the administration spoke to the negotiators at this? Um, I will say that uh, the administration are definitely in touch with the parties, which is not unusual, something that we have done many times before. And again, we continue to believe that the collective bargaining is the best way to reach a, a solution here uh, for all parties involved, as long as it's done in, in good faith. Um, dozens of state and local election officials raised concerns this week about the Postal Service's ability to get ballots delivered on time. Can you elaborate on what the administration is doing to ensure that the USPS is going to be able to get ballots? So I would refer you to the USPS on this one. Obviously, the president thinks it's incredibly important. Uh, he's, you know, voting is, is a sacred right, and, uh, and it should be uh, something that Americans 
are able to do that and capable and able to to make sure they're able to access that important uh, sacred right. That's one of the reasons why very early on uh, in his administration he signed an executive order to make it um, to make it easier. Uh, for people to to be able to cast their their votes, uh, I would refer you to to, to um, the U.S. Postal Service on specifics on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Corrine. Um The White House has maintained that the Vice President has had a seat at the table and a voice in all major decisions that President Biden has made during his term. At the debate on Tuesday, she distanced herself from the President, saying, "I am not Joe Biden. What I do offer is a new generation of leadership for our country." And I would remind you that the president also said in many times, uh, well, so I'll point you to the Oval Office address that uh, he was handing, passing the torch over, right, to a new generation. Uh, and he was proud to do that. He did it in an incredibly patriotic way, in a, in a selfless way. And that's what he was doing. Uh, and he said it himself. Uh, look, um, uh, what I will say is that all you have to do is look at what the president and the vice president has done together. Uh, and that is something that she continues to support. What we did to turn the economy around, what we did to make sure that we lower cost uh, when it comes to um, uh, whether it's uh, health care, uh, whether um, it's energy costs. Uh, she was the deciding vote on um, an Inflation Reduction Act that mattered. That is, you know, now uh, Medicare is able to, to, you know, to be able to negotiate with Big Pharma. We beat Big Pharma. Uh, and so she was able to lay out her, uh, her agenda with the president's supports. We believe they have a shared agenda. That's what we heard. That's what we saw from this vice president. Uh, and, um, and I'm, again, going to be really, uh, be really mindful on saying too much, going too much into the debate, uh, but I can but speak you do to the. Believe that she shares responsibility for the agenda of this administration. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, yes, they are partners in this. They're, she is a critical partner in what we have been able to do over the last four years. But we cannot forget. We cannot forget what they inherited going in. Right? We can't forget the economy that was in a tailspin. COVID was taking over. More than three thousand people were dying each day. There was no comprehensive plan on how to deal with COVID. This president and this vice president got to work and put shots in arms and checks in pockets. That matters. And on the optics of the last couple of days, President Biden has made a personal decision when he has encountered former President Trump not to share a handshake with him, which Vice President Harris did twice in the span of 24 hours. Does he agree with that decision? Does he believe that that was... She's in her own person. The vice president is her own person. She's is allowed to do what she feels uh, is the best thing to do. I, I cannot speak for how she uh, engages with the former president. She's her own person. Uh, and the president has his reasons. I'll and leave it there. Quickly, just a clarification on the president's comments on Ukraine. He said earlier this week when asked about the possibility to change the policy for Ukraine to use long-range weapons <coughs> into Russia, he said we're working on it. A U.S. official later clarified that there was no change in policy. Can you say what exactly is being worked on? So I'm not going to get into uh, the uh, policy del deliberations here in public. What I can say is basically what I said in answering another one of your colleagues' uh, questions about Ukraine specifically, obviously, which is that we want to make sure our focus is making sure that Ukraine has what it needs uh, to defend itself, to win back their territory, their sovereign territory, to win that back. And so that's what our focus is, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Uh, we, have con we have shown, and this president has shown and continues to show, a tremendous amount of support for Ukraine. His leadership has been very clear, clear and out front, uh, making sure that NATO is stronger, uh, adding two more NATO members. That was because of the president's late leadership. More than 50 countries he was able to bring together to support Ukraine as they continue to bravely fight uh, for their freedom. And that's our commitment. I'm not going to get into policy deliberations from here. Uh, go ahead, Frazier. I, I know last time I, I think I called you Michael. I'll I'm, forgive you. I don't apologize. Worry about it. It's fine. Water under the bridge. Uh, thank um, you. Oh, you're so kind. I, you. Anytime. Uh, I want to continue asking about Ukraine if yes. possible. Um, Putin today said uh, about these alleged plans to change the, um, the idea about long range missiles. Uh, he said that it would mean that NATO countries, the US, European countries, are at war with Russia. 
How concerned is the U.S. about that? I, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I'm not going to get into inter internal policy uh, deliberations from here. I will say what you've heard from my NSC colleagues at this podium. You've heard from this president. This war can end today if Mr. Putin will end the war that he started. It is his aggression. It is his war that he started. He can end it. He can end it. I'm going to leave it there. But his forces have also reclaimed part of the Kursk region that the Ukrainian forces took in the last couple of weeks. What's the White House's reaction to the Russian advances back into the Kursk region? We are going to do everything that we can so that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself. That is our commitment. I think you have seen this, uh, a, a very much focused, uh, a tremendous amount of support from this administration and also from our partners and allies in doing just that. And that's what you could expect to see. That's great. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, following up on Springfield, you said that these on, the sp uh, on Springfield, Springfield. Yep. Yeah, these Ohio. Fake yep. Theories, yeah, about about migrants uh, put lives in danger. So, how concerned are you about a potential rise in threats or even hate crimes targeting migrants? I, I mean, when you have uh, national leaders spewing hateful or lifting up hateful rhetoric and bizarre smear that has been debunked, as I just stated when I answered this question moments ago, that is dangerous. That is, yes, we are concerned. It is dangerous. I mean, you all have reported how communities, specifically Haitian communities, are fearing for their life because of how this is being lifted up. And this is about tearing communities apart. And we deserve more. Our country deserves more than that. So there is a concern. Anytime you see this type of rhetoric, this hateful rhetoric, these types of smears, yes, it could lead to dangerous scenarios. And that's why if you are a national leader in this country, if you're a leader of any kind, you should condemn, condemn this type of rhetoric. You should condemn it. We deserve more. And again, this is, I talk about our shared values. That's what the president wants. He wants to be able to, so that people to get together around our shared values. And that is what matters and that is what is important for our country. Okay, yeah, Jackie. Thanks, Frank. One more on the Trump hat. What did the president do with it? Did he right. keep it? Is he like saving it for the a Christmas present for his least favorite staffer or something? Oh, wow. I'm just, I'm. Well, you've thought about that one. <laughs> Least favorite curious. staffer. Did he, did he I don't know. Maybe it's on my desk chair. right now. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Right, on a heavier note, uh, about the economy. There is a, sure. a, a new analysis by the Republicans who are on the Congressional Joint Economic Committee. Uh, they looked at seven battleground states, and okay. according to their analysis, the average household is paying uh, for the same basket of goods and services on average about $1,000 more per month compared to January of 2021. And the numbers are pretty stark in places like Nevada and Arizona, it's almost $1,200 a month. Georgia, it's $1,075 a month. North Carolina, $1,017. <coughs> Has President Biden's policies positioned the vice president poorly in these states uh, to win this election? So I'm not gonna get into the election, I'm just not, I'm not gonna get into her path to victory and what it does for, it's just not something that I'm gonna speak to from here. What I can speak to is where we are now. Inflation, core inflation has gone down. That is important to note because of the work that they've been able to do. You see crap, uh, gas prices going down almost 50%. That's important. Uh, you see wages are rising faster than prices are. Uh, nearly uh, 16 million jobs created. And what I will say, so we have done the work uh, to see progress, progress in fighting inflation and lowering costs. Uh, and, but we do understand, we're not, I, I hear the numbers that you're telling me, we do understand that there is more work to be done. There is, there's more work to do, be done. And that's why we're gonna do what we can to lower cost uh, by investing in record energy production, for example, building three million new homes, capping prescription drugs, Cutting taxes for the middle class. Middle class is a president that talks about building, uh, building an economy from the bottom up, the middle out, and not leaving anybody behind. And we have to talk about what congressional Republicans are trying to do. Raise, raise costs by nearly $4,000 for the middle class. That's what they're doing. 
they're cut to, they want to cut Social Security and Medicare while giving breaks to billionaires and corporations. That is such an unpopular thing to do, and they continue to want to push that forward. They won't stop talking about it. They yeah, want to no. know. Oh. Social Security Medicare. And we, we went through all of that. Yes, we did. The, yeah, we, we, we went, in the midterms, we went right, through all yeah. of it. There were, we saw flyers and, and plans from uh, leaders of the Senate, uh, of the Senate, uh, uh, Senate Republicans. We saw that. We saw the back and forth with the president at two, well, at two uh, State of the Unions where certainly he pushed back on that and made them say he, that's not what they wanted to do, but that's what they were saying they wanted to do. They wanted to cut Social Security and Medicare. They've been very clear. This is, a, this is not just the last three and a half years. This has been for some time now. And they want to get rid of the Inflation Reduction Act that none of them, by the way, voted for, that beats Big Pharma. They want to get rid of that. That's going to lower cost for Americans. We're talking about important drugs, cancer drugs, diabetes. We're talking about capping insulin at 35 bucks a month for seniors that pay more than 400 bucks a month. You had say that we've turned the page on inflation, but American families aren't feeling that to the point where the vice president didn't even directly answer the question in the debate, do you believe that we Americans made, feel they're better off than four years ago? Look, we have, we have made progress in fighting inflation. That is something that we have seen from the numbers, from the data. That is a true in, in, in truth, right? Um, I believe that the VP highlighted on how we are better off, on how, on, on, off now, as, as well as her plans to build on that progress. That is something that she talked about. How are we going to build on that progress? Uh, and, you know, I said this moments ago, we, got, we can't forget what this administration inherited, an economy that was in a tailspin. That's what we inherited. It was paralyzed because the former president did nothing, did nothing during one of the once in a century pandemic. He did nothing. Donald Trump did nothing. We took action on that on, and now our economy is stronger than ever. We're out, out competing China. That's something that we did. Let's not forget when we took over, violent crime was at, uh, was, uh, was, we saw violent crime, murder at its highest in the former president's last year. And now it's at a 50 year low because of the work that we did. And it started with the American Rescue Plan. Again, no Republicans voted for it. They didn't want, want to vote for something that had money for local, local communities, local police enforcement to actually have the funding they needed to get more police officers. They didn't vote it. Just say yes to that question. I, you're going to have to speak directly to her team. What I saw is she laid out how to build on the progress that we've made. That's what we saw. That's what she's talking about. That's what she talks about, building on the progress that we have made. We had to fix. We had to fix what the Trump administration did. Okay. Thank you, Corinne. Um, Israel's UN mission said today that the six UNRWA work workers that were killed at the IDF strike yesterday at the UN school and shelter were members of Hamas. The U.S. Uh, the UN is neither confirming nor denying this. I was hoping you could give us the U.S. position on whether they are indeed Hamas members. Has Israel shared any evidence that they are members of Hamas? So what I can say is obviously we're aware of the uh, IDF strike in Gaza. Uh, and we are indeed concerned about there are reports of civilian casualties, so we are concerned about that. Uh, we're in touch with our Israeli counterparts uh, to get more information uh, in what happened. Uh, as you just said, IDF said they were uh, targeting Hamas officials, including those who were directly involved with the horrific attacks that we saw on October 7th. And so we've been clear that uh, you know Israel has a right and responsibility to go after Hamas, uh, but we also been clear that Israel must do this in a way that there is precaution, uh, in a way that uh, we protect, uh, do everything that they do to protect uh, more civilian lives. Uh, and so this is especially the case in declared humanitarian zones in Gaza, and that is something that we want to see. And so we're having, uh, 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 certainly conversations about that. We mourn, we mourn. And you hear say this all the time, uh, every Palestinian civilian lost in this conflict, including children. 
uh, and for far too many, far too many lives uh, continue uh, have been lost and continue to be killed and wounded. And so we're having we're having those uh, uh, those conversa conversations with our Israeli counterparts. Okay, so you don't you don't have a position. I'm not. Right I, now. I I'm I don't have a. I, I know the question about you're asking me about specifically about Hamas leaders uh, officials. Uh, I'm not going to speak to that. What I can say is we're in direct conversation with Just our Israeli counterparts. And moving on, uh, still on the Middle East, is the administration involved in bringing the remains of Turkish American Ashanur Ege, who was killed by IDF in the West Bank? Um, is the administration involved in bringing her remains back to Turkey? And how do you respond to Turkish anger, both from the government and the citizens, uh, to President Biden calling the shooting, quote, an accident? So let me just say uh, um, that uh, what the family and um, her loved ones, uh, I say Nora's loved ones are going through right now is uh, unimaginable. Uh, and I can't imagine the pain that they're going through with losing a child, uh, a loved one. And, uh, and their loss has certainly been on the president's mind. Uh, and so you saw the president release a statement uh, on, her, on her death. And um, the president said there must be a full accountability. Her killing uh, was indeed an outrage. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, just to reiterate what I said moments ago, Israel must do more. They must do more to make sure that incidents like these never happen again. And, um, again, the pain of losing a child is something that I can, uh, certainly that we can't even imagine. Is the U.S. helping Turkey? Sorry, is the U.S. helping yeah, to bring the remains? Uh, I I don't have anything to share with you on that. I would refer you to the State Department specifically on that one question. One. At the Quad Summit in Delaware uh, later this month, President Biden will be meeting with Prime Minister Kishida of Japan. What would his message be on U.S. steel um, acquisition by Nippon Steel? Look, I, I don't have anything as it relates to uh, Nippon Steel. I don't have anything to share on that. Um, uh, Sophia's obviously is going through their process. Uh, when they share their 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 uh, end of the process report, uh, that they do that, they'll do that to the press for the president. Uh, then the president will make obviously a decision. I just don't have anything to share. There's there's no news to be made uh, at this time, um, and the process continues. Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead, Nadia. Um, thanks. Um, the statement that the president released yesterday she described the killing of Aisha Noor as um, a tragic error. I'm just wondering how the White House came to this conclusion, considering that she was shot by a sniper um, into a bullet in the head, as execution style. The Washington Post did an investigation. It showed that she was shot 20 minutes after the clash had ended, and she, there's, all the protesters has moved from the main road. So how did you come to this conclusion? It was an error. And I want to say, like, her, her killing was, was uh, an outrage and should have never have happened. It should have never happened. That's what the president believes. It should have never have happened. I'm aware, uh, to answer your question, I'm aware of the analysis, uh, the various analysis that are out there uh, and have been published, aware of it. Uh, and uh, as we have said, we're going to continue to stay in close touch uh, with the Israeli and the Palestinian authorities uh, regarding the circumstances that led uh, to um, uh, Isa Noor's death. We're going to continue to have those conversations. Uh, and the president has been clear. He has been clear as well that there needs to be full accountability as well. We need to see full accountability here. But in all the previous incidents, whether it's Palestinian civilians or even Israelis, hostages who were carrying white flag and shot by the IDF, or American citizens, whether it's Shirin Abu Akhla or Aisha Nur or others, is the White House satisfied that Israel ever came to you and they found actually the people who did it, responsible and they held accountable? Are you satisfied with all this investigation? I, I, I'm not going to go into every investigation. I'm not, I'm just, I know I hear you, but I, I just, I'm not going to do that. Um, this should have never happened. This, this awful, awful killing should have never happened. Um, it's an outrage. And just to what the president was referring to, and we've said this, uh, is that the initial findings, the initial fi findings that were released by IDF, and it was also briefed, they also briefed the U.S. government on this. Uh, and so, look, the president also said 
there must be full accountability to what happened, and that's what we want to see. Red Cross workers were killed in Ukraine today. I just wondered why has the president not spoken with her members of her family who yeah. said that they've been interested in hearing from him? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I were aware of that. U.S. officials have been in touch uh, with uh, the family members, and so we are working on additional calls. I, I don't have anything to share outside of that. Is, are those with the president? I mean, is he going? We are working planning? on. We are working on additional calls, and I just don't have to share beyond uh, anything else to share beyond that. Go ahead, Karen. Go ahead, Karen. January sixth is going to be designated a national special security event by DHS and the Secret Service, which makes the counting certification of the electoral votes the highest security designation the federal government makes available. We've heard the president yeah. give many speeches, yeah. talking very passionately about what happened on January sixth. Uh, back in 2021, but what does it say now that something that is a routine part of the election process is now getting this level of a security designation? So, and you're right, this president has spoken very passionately about January 6th and what happened uh, um, on that day and how it was an attack on our democracy. Uh, he has shared his views and he's also said the importance of making sure that never happens again. He has said that many times again, in an impassionate, powerful way. Uh, I would, ha as it relates to this designation, this is something that DHS and uh, Secret Service, they can speak specifically to this designation. They made this designation, uh, so don't want to get ahead of them. Uh, but you're right, the president's spoken powerfully about this. Uh, he's been very clear that this cannot happen uh, again. And we know, uh, look at 2022, the elections from 22, 2022, we know that um, Americans care about their democracy. They care about their freedoms, uh, and that's where majority of Americans are. But I, I'm not going to get into specifics of the um, of what we heard from DHS and Secret Service today. Okay, Jared. Jared. Red Jared. Cross workers killed. Uh, UN Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield announced the U.S. is <coughs> backing of two permanent uh, African seats on the UN Security Council. What more can the White House share about the importance of this, and what insight and leadership Africa can provide to? Uh, uh, advancing international peace and security, and how likely does the administration believe that this can this resolution could be voted on at um, the General Assembly? So just to take a step back, two years ago at UNGA, uh, the president was able to announce a U.S. Uh, the, the U.S. commitment to to expand on the Council uh, with permanent representation uh, for countries from Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as countries we've long supported for permanent seats. And so he did that two years ago. And you saw today to uh, your point in your question, um, uh, you saw uh, the UN ambassador, uh, the US UN uh, ambassador uh, announce that our support for two permanent seats for African countries. Um, and that's something that African leaders called for. Uh, and certainly, obviously, this is something that the president supported. So it shows, I believe, our commitment, uh, the U.S. This is commitment uh, to supporting reforms to the Security Council. I think that's how you should see this and view this. Uh, and by doing that, it makes the uh, Security Council more effective. Uh, representation, you have representation and more credible. And so, any specifics beyond that, I would have to refer you to the State Department. But this is a commitment that you saw from this president two years ago, uh, coming uh, at. The, at UNGA uh, back then. Well, the, question, um, the venture capital firm, the Fearless Fund, uh, closed its grant program for black women-owned businesses to settle a lawsuit uh, that claimed that the grant was discriminatory. Um, doing so uh, avoided it going to the Supreme <coughs> Court that could have uh, ruled in having implications for race-based initiatives um, across the, in the private sector. Does the White House have any reaction to this decision, this lawsuit? So, uh, if, um, Anything specific to the litigation, it's an ongoing litigation. I would have to refer to Department of Justice. Uh, but I will say, and this is something I think I said moments ago, and the president has said, I'm just repeating what the president has said moments, uh, many, many times during this administration, that d diversity is our greatest strength. Uh, and that is important. You see that in the policies that the Biden-Harris has moved forward. You've seen that, uh, whether it is schools or our militaries or our businesses, uh, even in government, uh, this is the most diverse presidential administration in history uh, because the president and the vice president believes in that. They believe in making sure that um, when you talk about policy, uh, you're t talking about um, all the communities and you're bringing them together and no community is left behind. Uh, 
this is an ongoing litigation that uh, I can't speak to. That's something for DOJ not to speak to. I know I have to. I have to get Ukraine, going. Three red cross um, workers yeah. killed in Ukraine today. Yeah. Can you address that? Go ahead, that? Ed. Go ahead, Ed. Um, I want to ask you about the new census data that came out. Um, it shows that childhood poverty went to 13.7 percent. Uh, it's more than double childhood poverty in 2021. So why aren't things getting better with all the programs and the money that's been spent or, or signed into law under the Biden-Harris administration? So, and I am really glad that you that you uh, brought this up. Uh, if you think about the first year, and I kind of spoke about this a little bit uh, in the past, you know, 40 minutes or so, uh, being at the podium, is that what we were able to do because of the American Rescue Plan is that we were able to cut uh, child poverty by nearly uh, half, and that's a record low. Uh, and and that's because we were able to expand on the child tax credit. Uh, and again, the American Rescue Plan, not one Republican voted for that plan. Not one, not one. Especially what was, if you think about, just think back what was going on during that time. And they didn't decide not to vote for it. Again, economy was in a tailspin. And, and to this day, Republicans have refused. They continue to refuse, repeatedly blocked, repeatedly blocked our attempts to restore that expanded child tax credit. Again, you're talking about poverty? That's what it was able to do. And what it did is lift millions of children out of poverty. And this just happened as recently as last month. Senate Republicans blocked a bipartisan bill to expand the child tax cut. So we can build on what we were able to do the first year. Republicans are getting in the way. They are, they're getting in the way. But we had $904 billion in non-defense spending in 2024, and you're telling me that the only the child tax credit is the way to fix child We poverty. saw what passing the American Rescue Plan, which expanded the child tax credit within, it was a provision, it was part of the American Rescue Plan, and because we were able to expand the child tax credit, the data showed that, uh, that uh, the poverty, child poverty, was cut down by nearly half. And one of the ways, obviously, when you see that, what you want to do is continue to expand the child tax credit. That's what Democrats wanted to do. That's what Republic that Republicans don't want to do. That's what the president wanted to do. If you see something that works, as a legislator, don't you want to continue it? Don't you want to continue something that works? They got in the way. So if you're talking about child tax, uh, ch uh, child poverty, we know we know how to deal with it, and they refuse to, they refuse to move forward with it. They refuse to move with the legislation that they just blocked just last month. On another subject, the Treasury yeah. monthly statement came out today, and it showed that uh, we still have a deficit. We're going to have a deficit of 1.9 trillion dollars uh, this year. Um, you know, the focus on the president and the vice president has been uh, raising taxes. They want to tax. Uh, raise tax on corporations and others, um, and spending on programs. What's the plan for the debt? So, we got to step back here for a second. Uh, the last administration increased, they increased the debt by a record $8 trillion. I hope you wrote about that. They didn't sign a single law to reduce the deficit. I hope you wrote about that. The president, President Biden, the current president, signed a $1 trillion uh, of deficit reduction into law. He's taking action to deal with our deficit. $8 trillion deficit in the last administration. I really hope you wrote about that. And his budget would lower the deficit by another $3 trillion by making millionaires and, and biggest corporations pay their fair share. At, to your question, that's what it would do. Cutting spending on special interests. That's what he wants to do. Republicans want to, again, they want to increase the deficit by Expand, ex, expanding the tax, the Trump tax cut, which would cost $5 trillion. That's what they want to do. Uh, so I, I really hope you wrote about, uh, in the past, what the Trump administration did when it came to the deficit and what we've had to, what we've had to deal with and fix. And every question that you ask me, I mean, there's some irony. Every question that you ask me is something that we're trying to fix and Republicans get in the way of. Literally, every question that you ask me. I'm talking about the debt, the, the actual I, I, deficit spending is still <laughs> deficit spending. How do we reduce the debt? And I'm debt? telling you what the president has done. $1 trillion is not a small number in trying to, in signing a legislation to deal with the deficit. Now, $8 trillion, a record number. In debt. That's what the Trump administration did. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.